I'd like to welcome you this afternoon to the fifth Humanities Forum event of the fall 2009 semester. My name is Rebecca Bowling, and I'm the director of the Drescher Center for the Humanities. This is the fifth of a five-part series commemorating the 50th anniversary of C.P. Snow's Two Cultures Lecture. Fifty years ago, on May 7, 1959, the scientist novelist C.P. Snow delivered his famous Reed Lecture at Cambridge University. Published as The Two Cultures and the Scientific Revolution, Snow identified a deep and dangerous divide between the sciences and the humanities. This series of lectures is intended to stimulate further discussion about the relationship between the sciences and the humanities, both here at UMBC and in academe and society as a whole. And just in talking to Dr. Fuller a minute ago, he was saying, we are commemorating it much more than they are in Britain, which is interesting in and of itself. This series is sponsored by UMBC's Dresser Center for the Humanities, the Human Context of Science and Technology Program, and the Social Sciences Forum. Besides this afternoon's lecture by Professor Steve Fuller of the University of Warwick, next Monday, November 2nd, Dr. Naomi Oreskes, Provost of the New Sixth College for the Intersection of Culture, Art, and Technology at University of California, San Diego, will be speaking at 4 o'clock on the 7th floor of the library, and the following Monday, November 9th, we will be hosting a faculty panel discussion on connections between the sciences and the humanities. An entire list of the events that are part of the C.P. Snow series, as well as other departmental lectures that are part of this fall's Humanities Forum, are available on the benches as you leave the gallery, so please be sure to take a copy if you don't have one already. Also remember, you can always go to our website, which is www.umbc.edu backslash Dresher Center for more details. Dr. Joe Tadarevich, the director of UMBC's Human Context of Science and Technology program, will introduce our speaker this afternoon, Dr. Steve Fuller. Thank you very much, Rebecca, and thanks to everybody who has worked so hard to put together this series. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all to this installment in a continuing special series on C.P. Snow's Two Cultures. We've heard about Sir Charles and his introduction to the concept in 1959 and how it touched nerves back then and then took on a life of its own. While Snow decried the gulf between what he called scientists and literary intellectuals, he had unbounded optimism that more science and technology, especially in the developing world, would solve many problems. We've been on an intellectual and policy journey ever since and are chastened by the results. Snow has come to be seen as somewhat simplistic, the wider world more resilient, complex, harder to manage. We are hearing from other scholars in this series some of the details of the loss of confidence in simple solutions and simple authority, the growing awareness of the complexities of the process by which scientific knowledge and technical systems are produced, and how bridging the two cultures plays out in various institutions. Testament to the vigor and diversity of this area is the joint meeting of the Society for Social Studies of Science and the European Association for the Study of Science and Technology in Washington this weekend. More than a thousand scholars in over 200, almost 200 sessions. Snow thought the scientists of his day better prepared, for at least they were literate in the other culture. But in the ensuing decades, his literary intellectuals dove into the details of scientific and technical practice with enthusiasm and, some would say, the irreverence of a bull in a china shop. Historians, sociologists, philosophers, anthropologists, and many other humanists and social scientists dug into documents, laboratories, and even personal affairs to find out how science and technology are done and what they mean. In the 1990s, they had begun to wear out their welcome in some circles, and we witnessed the science wars, the culture wars, and symbolic episodes that burst forth at the Smithsonian over exhibitions like the Enola Gay and Science in American Life. Today, we are welcoming Steve Fuller, Professor of Sociology at the University of Warwick, a historian, philosopher, and sociologist whose work is wide with respect to subjects and fields and deep with respect to fundamental issues. He graduated summa cum laude in history and sociology in 1979 from Columbia University home of Robert K. Merton, whom many consider the founder of American sociology of science. He took an MPhil in history and philosophy of science at Cambridge University, and then the PhD in the same subject from the University of Pittsburgh in 1985. 
a premier site for the philosophy of science in the United States. And I say that sincerely, even as uh, myself being an Indiana University graduate with the uh, same subject. After posts at other universities, he was made chair in sociology and social policy at the University of Durham in 1994, and then on to his current post at Warwick. In between, he's held other posts and received honors far too numerous to mention. He has been an active participant in the scholarly as well as the public debate over the foundations and meaning of science, producing 11 books, six more under contract, numerous chapters, and has refereed journal articles on his CV stop at number 135 in 2006. As if this scholarly production is not impressive enough, he's also found expression in just about every other medium, dramatic productions, podcasts, video, film. Throughout, he has been fearless with respect to controversy, penetrating in his analysis, and when necessary, he's held some of our heads underwater until we drank. He has also been very generous to come a very long way and to spend some time with us. And his subject is something he knows a fair bit about. Snow, Two Cultures, and the Science Wars. Welcome, Steve Bullock. Just so you don't get scared here, uh, as I speak, I will, I, I will be typing some things, some concepts and things that I mentioned that might not be familiar to you. And when we have the question period afterwards, uh, you know, feel free to ask about anything that I mentioned, because I realize you know, this is a very broad topic, and I'm sure this is a very diverse audience. And uh, it's important that, as it were, everybody get into the conversation. So I'm not sure always where people are starting from here. Uh, but where I want to start from is sort of in the very beginning. Um, when uh, throughout the history of uh, Western culture, especially as we move into the modern era, there's been a lot of um, discussion about so what Kant in particular called the conflict of the faculties, right? That is to say, sort of the internal conflict within university life. And the one that I think that uh, is, we're most familiar with uh, and has sort of the, uh, the arts versus the sciences, okay? And uh, it's interesting to, to, to look at where that kind of distinction first arose. Uh, and it has to do, uh, to a large extent, with another distinction, which uh, has to do between the ancients and the moderns. And in fact, this is the context in which the word modern originally arises. We already have this kind of distinction in the late Middle Ages. Um, and what this distinction amounts to, uh, when the, by the time we get into the 17th century, is basically, on the one hand, a group of scholars who look to the past as providing sort of the exemplars for all of knowledge. And that, in a sense, what we try to do when we try to understand reality is that we try to get back to that original state of wisdom that over the centuries perhaps has been lost as it's been transmitted from generation to generation. Okay? That's what the ancients, uh, you know, those who were on the side of the ancients and typically associated with the art subjects, that was what they were about. The moderns, on the other hand, see the truth very much in the future, okay? Uh, and in other words, that the kind of knowledge that we have now should at best be considered a kind of rough draft that will be successively improved through further inquiries into the nature of things. Um, and so from that standpoint, uh, one doesn't take any particular theory or book as a sacred text, but really as something that needs to be worked over again and again and again, and perhaps at some point just be left behind completely. Now, um, in today's culture, of course, we tend to think about texts, you know, we tend to group texts into two categories as to whether they should be treated the first way, that is to say, in terms of some sort of source of ultimate sacred knowledge, versus a text that can be superseded by follow-up texts in the future. We tend to draw quite a strong distinction, and that is often the distinction between the arts and the sciences. So for example, if you're a natural science student, right, uh, you would not necessarily read Darwin's original text today. You would not read Newton's original text or even Einstein's original text. What you would read would be the parts of their theories and their findings that in fact have been incorporated in light of subsequent inquiries. So, you know, and I think this is a pretty obvious kind of point, and it's one of the reasons why textbooks in science uh, 
you know, books written as textbooks have such a significance that they do not have in the humanities or even to a certain extent in the social sciences where very often one does read the original texts uh, and as it were take them to still be sources of you know, wisdom and so forth that perhaps has not, have not been fully mined or farmed or whatever metaphor you want to use to actually extract what's inside of those things. Okay? Um, and um, in this respect, by the way, one aspect of the current science wars that's very interesting from the standpoint of this distinction is the fetishism of Darwin. Because here we're, we got a kind of interesting borderline case because it's quite clear, especially in light of the uh, sort of the revival of creationism and various sorts of opposition to evolutionary theory, not only in this country but increasingly around the world, um, Darwin is being reintroduced as an original text to read. Okay, uh, and as it were, a lot of the wisdom of evolution can already be found in Darwin, and what follows from it are just kind of footnotes to Darwin. This is getting to be increasingly a, a, a sort of a popular way of presenting Darwin, which was not the case, let's say, 20, 25 years ago, when Darwin was much more thought of the way we think about Newton today with regard to physics, where Newton made some contributions, but whatever contributions he made are incorporated into the contemporary textbooks, and you don't need to read Newton again. Okay, but now people are telling us to go back to read Darwin. Okay, and that's kind of interesting, and the significance of that we can, we can, we can talk about. But it, does, but, but it is a very sort of striking feature, that you basically have two forms of knowledge, two sets of disciplines, one of which establishes the authority of knowledge in the past, essentially, and the other which, in a way, projects the authority of knowledge into the future, where we're heading, and that whatever we have now is just a rough draft, something that will be superseded subsequently. Okay? So that's the original distinction between the ancients and the moderns, um, and that kind of... Uh, reverberates uh, throughout um, the, the, the centuries. Now, one of the things that, that starts to happen uh, in the 18th century, during the period of enlightenment, is that you start to get various hybrid forms of knowledge, and in a sense are sort of bridging these two sensibilities that I've just identified. And so we start to get a lot of discussion of what, you might, what gets called sometimes third culture. If the two cultures are the arts and the sciences, and, and you're imagining these, in the starkest differences possible, right? So you have like the sort of humanistic disciplines on the one hand, and you have the natural sciences on the other. Um, then this idea of a third culture that in some sense bridges the differences between them and provides a kind of rounded, comprehensive understanding of reality. Now this term third culture gets used, and its history gets discussed, by a German sociologist by the name of Wolf Lebanese, whose name is up here. Um, and he wrote a book about 20 years ago now called Between Literature and Science, which in a sense sort of describes what the issue is here with regard to establishing this third culture. Now, if you go to the 18th century, the candidates for third culture um, would be, broadly speaking, um, fields that we would now consider natural history, um, civil history, and to mention some names that some of you may be familiar with, especially from the, the British side of the Enlightenment, uh, Darwin's grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, and the Scottish Enlightenment figure, Adam Ferguson. I don't know if, uh, if, if this name means anything to anyone anymore, Adam Ferguson. He was a contemporary of David Hume. He was a very important historian in his day, uh, and he was also a diplomat who was part of the diplomatic mission from Britain to the United States to sort of put an early end to the uh, uh, American Revolution, but that failed. Um, and, uh, but but the, one of the interesting things about Ferguson, which is still worth looking at, is in the original, in the, in this, not the original, but the 1780 edition, I believe, of the Encyclopedia Britannica, he wrote the article on history. Um, and there you see uh, one of the first demonstrations of timelines, where you have different cultures going through history. So what's happening in all these different places at the same time? And this becomes kind of a, uh, and, and the interesting thing about it, I should point out, is that Ferguson is imagining, and this is where we start to get to the third culture side of this, um, he's imagining these different cultures in, in quasi-racial terms, in that kind of soft racial term. I mean, because you've got to keep in mind that in the 18th century, the idea that one's cultural traits could be somehow transmitted through heredity, uh, just by virtue of a group of people having lived in a land for many generations, that was... That kind of view, which we associate with Lamarck in the history of biology, that was a very standard kind of view to have. Um, and so what, what Ferguson was identifying in these different strands where you'd have the names of these different cultures and then you'd have the time periods over which uh, they are being uh, discussed uh, is, 
kind of a, a sort of typology of races, you might say. Okay? And so there is this blurring that's taking place in that article alone between what we would call the natural history of humanity and the civil history of humanity. And that was quite a common thing to do in the 18th century. And it's really only in the 19th century, um, as one finds out more about the nature of heredity um, and, and also the people's relationship to politics and so forth start to change as well, that you start to get this, as it were, disaggregation of natural history and civil history, where, where you start to get the separation we're now more familiar with, where you have like biology on the one hand and sociology on the other as two separate fields. But during the 18th century, it looked like these fields were very much intertwined with each other, and they formed a kind of third culture, right? And, and um, if you read somebody like David Hume, for example, when he does this history of, of, of Britain, uh, which was the work for which he was primarily known in his own lifetime, um, there you see a lot of arguments, which would have, again, been very familiar at the time, of why certain things succeed or fail with regard to political initiatives have to do with whether they conform to the nature of the people to whom they are applied. Okay, so you have a kind of, so, so again, there's a mixing of arguments from our standpoint going on here. There's a kind of quasi-racial sort of argument about the nature of the people concerned, but there's also this kind of cultural political argument about impact on the environment, and they're not really very clearly distinguished back then. They only get really, start to get distinguished in the 19th century, and really at the end of the 19th century, they start to get very clearly distinguished. Um, now, the reason why I'm going through all this little bit of history here is that there is a sense in which um, that sense of third culture from the 18th century has been revived, it seems to me, um, with the fields like evolutionary psychology and sociobiology over the past 30 years or so. Okay? Um, and, and you may know, at least some of you may know, um, that there is uh, this, um, I think it's, it's nice, edge. Edge, the third culture, what gets called now the third culture, if, you were, if you're a, a denizen of the internet, and you sort of cyber surf a bit, and you want to know what does third culture mean to people who hang out in this kind of virtual space, this is what you come up with. You come up with Edge. Um, and uh, Edge is the brainchild of a literary uh, agent, John Brockman, who is one of the most influential figures in intellectual history of the second half of the 20th century, though you probably don't realize that. Because this is the man who managed to come up with the enormous contracts for the likes of Stephen Hawking and Richard Dawkins and Stephen Pinker and all these people who write popular science books that in a way have kind of molded the thinking around this kind of third culture, and especially in the biological arena. If you think of people like E. O. Wilson of sociobiology fame, Stephen Pinker, right, with the blank slate and the language instinct, right, uh, you think of Richard Dawkins, of course, with his numerous works, right, all of these people are making very direct kinds of connections between things that we would normally regard as being in the humanistic realm to things that we would normally regard as being in the biological realm, uh, and very often, you might say, uh, bypassing what we would normally call social science. I mean, this is the interesting thing about the EDGE website, uh, is that the kind of people who typically participate in this are indeed people who are interested, as it were, in the deep questions of human nature, blah, 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 but the, the sort of people who tend to be part of it are not social scientists. They tend to be some humanists and mostly natural scientists, but kind of very well read types. And so we've got this, and, and this kind of sensibility here um, that you see with these guys is very much, I think, in the mold of the 18th century natural historians and civil historians, people like Adam Ferguson that I was just talking about earlier, who of course existed before social science ever happened. So in other words, the guys who existed before social science ever happened kind of think about things pretty much like the guys who never have read social science. Okay, it's kind of what I'm saying. Um, and, and I think if you want, um, if you want some, uh, an interesting bit of evidence, uh, if you look at the blank slate by Steven Pinker, which came out now about five, six years ago, um, you, you probably know what the title is an allusion to this kind of view that, uh, you know, uh, that's associated with John Locke. Um, that we are sort of born as blank slates and the environment and culture etches itself on us and that's how we get our identities. And this is the thesis that Pinker is radically opposing. Okay? And he associates the blank slate thesis with basically the entire history of social science. That you really don't have social science unless you've got this kind of blank slate thesis because basically what that shows is uh, 
that in a sense you can ignore the biological front loading, you might say, and you can just spend all your time looking at the stuff that's etched and where does the etching come from and that having to do with the environment making some moves on your brain, okay? Uh, and that's the end of the story. Um, and so he basically thinks that, you know, this is naive and it leads to bad politics and all the rest of it because in a sense what it does is it kind of creates this illusion as far as he's concerned that we can basically make ourselves into anything we want to be, right? This is the illusion that's created by the blank slate thesis and he thinks this underwrites pretty much most of social science, especially the social science that has led to politics and policy implications where you end up getting people having enormously utopian ambitions and expectations about what can be accomplished just by rearranging incentives and environments and things of that kind. And at the end of the day, that's not going to work because it neglects some fundamental conditions about human beings by virtue of their genetic makeup that's manifested in all kinds of ways that in fact put constraints on just how much change people can undergo and be expected to respond reasonably to. Okay? Um, so there is this kind of normative punchline to this, which is that we need to scale down our expectations with regard to what is politically possible. Okay? Now, a lot of this, you know, a lot of this stuff, I mean, it's not by accident that this kind of stuff is happening now, again, um, and it's not to do necessarily with a sudden explosion of research that is confirming these theses of evolutionary biology and sociobiology. I don't think this can, this kind of mentality, the revival of what I see as basically an 18th century mentality, the revival of it I don't think is due necessarily to some great body of scientific work that suddenly has come on the scene, but rather it has a lot to do with um, political failure. It has to do with the failure of socialism. It has a lot to do with what is perceived as uh, the slowness or the difficulty with, it, with which large-scale policy initiatives haven't quite made the changes that people had promised they would make in the 1960s, let's say, which was kind of the, the high period where we thought if we just rearrange the environment, we'll rearrange the world, okay? And so it tends, this sort of position tends to dump very much on Marx and on socialists and things of that kind. Uh, in fact, uh, this position has gone very far. Um, some of you may know of the uh, great philosopher of animal liberation, Peter Singer, who's now got a chair in values at Princeton. Um, he wrote a book that was kind of a manifesto, so a very short thing. I recommend you read it if you're, if you're not on top of all this stuff. It's called The Darwinian Left. In America, it's published by Yale. Um, it's a small book, I would say about 35,000 words. Um, and what he's arguing there is that if we want to talk about scientifically responsible politics in the 21st century, we need to be talking about Darwin rather than Marx as the kind of exemplary figure from which we then construct our uh, policy initiatives. So we have to recognize some fundamental limits of a Darwinian kind with regard to human nature. So for example, limits to what, how altruism can be uh, promoted and things of that kind, and the degree to which certain kinds of persistent inequalities may in fact be genetically programmed. So in other words, the, uh, the overall, the kind of, law, you know, the overall idea of egalitarianism especially across salient categories of the human population, so for example, gender or race or so forth, there may be limits to the extent to which egalitarianism along those categories can be achieved. And Singer himself actually uses the example of gender, uh, the possibility of gender equality as perhaps being uh, overstated. And this, uh, this issue came to a head, you may recall, a few years ago now with Larry Summers, who's a former president of Harvard University, um, who was making an argument of this kind. And it's interesting, and of course he then had to leave the, the presidency in, in, in light of that and other things. Um, but the interesting thing was, um, at the time, I don't know if you recall, but Steven Pinker, who's a professor of psychology at Harvard, was one of Summers' big backers on this point, right? That Pinker was there in public saying, well, you know, Summers has got a point. There may be some kind of you know, genetic thing going on there. Why there aren't women, and you know, aren't so many women who are top scientists, right? Which was what the issue under contention was. Okay. So the point is that this issue um, is very much um, on the table. It's very much promoted. Uh, it's promoted by this guy Brockman. It's a certain kind of third culture that I think is increasingly prominent. 
Uh, and it's basically a pincer attack, you might say, coming from the humanities side and the natural science side to squeeze out the significance of the social sciences and to recover a kind of late 18th century natural civil history view of things before the social sciences got established. Um, uh, Lepanese's book, um, I recommend because what he basically does in the book uh, is he actually shows how you get from that 18th century position, which I think we're returning to now, um, to the position where we actually have proper social sciences and we have sociology in particular. And sociology in particular as a discipline is, in a sense, the main target for all this. Because sociology, I would say, of all the social sciences, if we think of a political science and economics and psychology and geography and anthropology, sociology has been the one that has been most consistent in talking about um, the distinctiveness of uh, humanity, uh, all people are created equal. Uh, that's been much more part of the ideology of that discipline than the other social sciences. And, and Lepini shows how, in fact, sociology emerges in a way from trying to move away from this, um, from this kind of natural history view. Now, one of the things, uh, by the way, I should say, what, what's, the, what's the plot? Well, the interesting thing is that all of these people who uh, I've described as being part of that natural history, civil history tradition of the third culture, one of the things they all had in common was that they were anti-clerical. Okay, so they are, and the, you know, so in other words, what they are doing, what they were doing in the 18th century, was that they were presenting a kind of account of the human condition that was continuous with an account of animal conditions, right? And, and so this is the spirit in which they talk about the way in which, you know, the land and the blood and so forth forms the way people are and so forth, is that they were basically moving away from a kind of theological perspective which would give a very special kind of history to humanity. Right, typically a history that maybe began 4004 BC or something like that, you know, where the Bible begins it, you know, and then people move on from there, which was a still a very common way of talking about human history in the 18th century. Okay? Um, and so one of the things that sociology does in the 19th century to oppose this is it recovers in secular guise a lot of the theological issues. And uh, I don't want to talk too much about this, but the, for those of you who are interested in the history of sociology and how it was trying to be a kind of third culture. Um, there is a very, you, you look at the Auguste Comte, who's normally regarded as the founder of sociology, as a, he coins the word in the 1830s, um, and also um, he's the person responsible for positivism as a concept. Um, he is very self-conscious in thinking about this discipline that he's mapping out as a successor to theology in the secular world that could be used as a way of uh, running states or running the world even, okay? Uh, and this whole idea that scientists can run the world to a large extent is an outgrowth of his kind of thinking. Um, now, of course, part of what also goes on in the 19th century, besides this attempt on the part of sociology to uh, move away from the natural history perspective, is that you do, get, you do get positions that look a lot like the kind of two cultures position or at least the beginnings of what looks like the two cultures position in the sense that C.P. Snow is talking about in the 1950s. Okay? So one person who I, who I should draw to your attention here is uh, Matthew Arnold. Uh, just out of curiosity, how many people have heard of Matthew Arnold? Good, good, about 50%. Um, now Matthew Arnold is the person who's very often uh, credited with introducing the word culture into the English language, okay? Um, in, in, I mean, because the word, of course, you know, German Kultur had been around uh, at least since the late 18th century, um, but uh, Arnold is really the one who, who starts to introduce this term uh, as, as in, in this kind of complicated way that we kind of come to know it. Namely, um, it's not just a descriptive term with regard to a certain body of practices, customs, and so forth, like an anthropologist might talk about it, it is that, but it's also normative, right, in the sense that, you know, culture is good, it's good for the people who have it at least, and if you're going to be one of those people, you better have it, right, so that sense of normative sense of culture, uh, Matthew Arnold's responsible for that. And one of the things uh, that uh, Arnold, by the way, Arnold, you know, you may know him primarily as a poet and an essayist, but by profession he was a schools inspector, okay. Um, hollowed tradition in Britain, inspecting stuff and having to do with education. Um, and uh, one of the things that uh, he was concerned about, so he's living in the period in the third quarter of the 19th century now, right, so 1860s, um, 
And we're talking about a period where the humanities are still very dominant in the university system, by far, but at the same time, the natural sciences are beginning to make some inroads. And certainly, their economic impact is very strongly felt. So, you know, it's not, not no one, the people realize the natural sciences are very important. They just haven't really made it into the curriculum. And Arnold is one of these guys, along with Thomas Henry Huxley, the person who's known as Darwin's bulldog, these guys are basically having public arguments about how to square this, right? What is going to be the future relationship between the arts and the sciences, given what everybody is granting, namely the ascendancy of the sciences, in what up to this point has been a primarily humanistic culture with regard to higher education, okay? You may know Huxley's views very strongly. He was very much into having a lot of science in the university, very much make it the foundation of it, have the universities run by scientists and all that kind of stuff. It really takes a long time, by the way, for that kind of idea to take hold. I mean, it's, you really, it's only after World War I that you really start to begin to see scientists running universities. The number of theologians who run even public universities in the early 20th century is quite astounding if you, uh, if you look back at it, okay? And it's only after World War I you begin to get scientists doing what Huxley said. Arnold has a much more measured view about the matter. matter. He's much more on the humanistic side. But he, he, he makes a distinction that is a very resonant distinction uh, about the excesses of both sides of this divide of the arts and sciences. Um, and, and these are words, again, of his coinage. Um, barbarians, Philistines. OK? See? Wasn't it great to live in Victorian England? You could, and you think we have great swear words now. This is great stuff, right? So we've got this contrast between barbarians and philistines, OK? Now, who are these barbarians, right? Well, the barbarians are basically the Oxbridge-educated humanists, OK, who, in a sense, don't really know much about the detail of the past, but they're very emotionally infused with the spirit of Rome, right, which they're going to cre recreate in Britain through the empire by sallying forth and having all sorts of foreign adventures and things like this. And, 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 and as far as uh, Arnold was concerned, that was a completely travesty to the humanistic tradition. Okay? Um, living Britain, I should say, we do have some politicians who still sound a bit like that, right? who in a sense will be quoting Tacitus or somebody like that and then launching us into war somewhere. All right? Because in a sense, that's what they think it is to be reliving and reviving those ancient glories, right? So in other words, uh, you know, they, they, they sort of, they don't quite uh, see the more measured aspect of it. They see it as some golden age that needs to be reproduced now. And so it gets used to license all kinds of hazardous political activity. The Philistine, on the other hand, um, comes from the science side. And what, and, and, and what in particular bothers Arnold about the Philistine is this idea of leveling differences in quality to differences in quantity. Okay, sort of utilitarian mentality, right? Uh, I mean, Jeremy Bentham, you know, used to say uh, that pushpin, uh, which is a sort of kid's game, is as good as poetry, right? Why? With respect to the, with the amount of pleasure that it provides the person doing it. So in other words, it doesn't matter what the quality of the activity is, but if people get the same amount of pleasure from doing two different activities, then they're equally good. Right? The activity itself doesn't matter, it's the amount of pleasure you get from it. And this is the Philistine's view of the world, right? Uh, and the Philistine tends to reduce everything to a kind of common standard of pleasure, and typically this ends up becoming a sort of common standard of money, how much does it cost, right? You know, uh, value gets reduced to price, this kind of thing. Okay? Um, and, um, and for Arnold, this is a kind of um, what you might say a, a sort of a pathology of a certain scientific frame of mind, if you associate a scientific frame of mind with one that is calculating and measuring and all of that, and then the problem is you end up applying those kinds of distinctive scientific skills to areas where they do not apply. Okay, at least this is the way that Arnold saw this. And so you end up getting the scientists as the Philistines and the humanists as the barbarians. And then in a sense, both of them need to be educated and they need to understand what it is of value to their respective forms of knowledge in, in making a complete human being. It seems to me this, uh, th this sort of point is still with us today. Um, how much more time do I have? You have 20 minutes. 20 minutes, okay. Um, now let's move to the 20th century um, and get to C.P. Snow. And I want to say a little bit about uh, this lecture of his at Cambridge, the Reed Lecture, 1959, because I do think there's a certain, the, the typical way of reading this lecture or, or is um, 
in terms, and I think this is the way it was presented here, um, that uh, it's the humanists who have to catch up, right? That in a sense, and, and I, I think the context here, let, let's just be clear about this. C.P. Snow is a trained physicist who actually, who also writes novels that were actually quite popular in their day. They happen to be novels about scientists. Um, and he was also a person who was active in government policy with regard to science. So Snow was kind of all over the place, and he was the sort of person who wrote for uh, newspapers, he was in the BBC, you know, so he was just a general public intellectual. He wasn't a particularly distinguished person in anything. He was an all-rounder, okay? Um, and uh, it is true that the, you might say the most memorable parts of, uh, of Snow's lecture were the ones where he was uh, complaining that uh, humanists don't know the second law of thermodynamics and things like that. Um, but as a matter of fact, Snow believed that learning had to happen on both sides. Um, and in particular, he was very concerned about the education of scientists for a very specific reason, namely because he was convinced, and it was already happening in the post-war period, that the kinds of jobs that in the past would have been held by people with classics degrees, let's say, were now increasingly being held by people who were engineers, economists, and natural scientists generally. And, that, and we're talking about jobs in the civil service, okay? Um, and and so, so as the job profile is changing, uh, you know, in the post-war period, uh, it becomes really important for these scientists to remain in touch or to gain some touch with the traditional values of Britain. And what he means by that um, it, it is that they should be, you know, they should understand liberal democratic values, where they come from, why people respect them, why it's important, for example, to consult with people, things of that kind, that kind of humanization of policymaking. And that, in fact, was, from the, from the standpoint of where Snow had practical impact on British education and the higher education sector uh, in the late 50s and early 60s, it was through that side of the equation, right? Through the prov provision of liberal arts programs for scientists, right? With the understanding that the scientists were the ones who were going to be running the country soon and that they needed to be humanized in some serious kind of way. Um, and why did he think this was necessary? Well, the precedents in the post-war period with regard to scientists intervening in the public domain were not terribly promising. They were doing it a lot, but the effects were quite um, jarring. Uh, and in particular, um, one figure who, it'd be interesting to see who knows him. How many of you have heard of him? John Desmond Burnell. Put, a, put your hands up for him. Okay, a few, a couple. Um, very famous, a very important man, I think, in the history of science. X-ray crystallographer at Cambridge, eventually became professor of physics at Birkbeck College, London. Um, he was a kind of mentor to Watson and Crick and that generation of people who eventually discovered the structure of DNA, but he himself didn't really contribute directly to that discovery. Um, but Burnell is mostly known, I think nowadays, for being this kind of full-on Marxist. Okay, he was one of these guys, he was the guy who in the early 1930s brought in all of these Stalinist Soviet historians of science who were providing very kind of heavy um, sociological, political understandings of the nature of science. So, you know, when you hear about uh, these accounts, they're not so prominent anymore, but they were very prominent well into the 1960s of, uh, you know, uh, Newton is the expression of bourgeois ideology, right? Uh, and he was really uh, trying to uh, enhance uh, Britain's military advantage by figuring out how the cannonballs would leave, uh, you know, the orbit and become satellites. Uh, and, and all that kind of talk, which you probably run into at some point, right? These very heavy kind of Marxist explanations of how science is an expression of economic and political interest. Well, this is Burnell, okay? This is Burnell. Um, and Bernal believed, as, as Marxists of the period believed, that um, the key thing here, that science was the future, no doubt about it. But not only was science the future, but that in a sense, scientists needed to take control of the state. Right? That basically, you know, in other words, you needed scientific public policy. Okay? And so the scientists just needed to be in there. And what they needed to do in particular is they had to override the kind of superstitious, taken for granted traditional beliefs that ordinary people had that were being promulgated through very inefficient democratic mechanisms. Okay? Now this went down like a lead balloon in Britain. But this is the sort of stuff, and the interesting thing about Bernal is he was very upfront about this, and he was a guy who was very, you know, who, who would be on these chat shows that the BBC had back then and still have now on the radio, 
um, where people are talking about the great issues of the day and the future of civilization. You know, we live in the atomic era. What are we to do? You know, what if the atomic bomb gets in the hands of the wrong people? You can imagine all this stuff is being discussed in the late 1940s, early 1950s. And you got Bernal sitting there and say, well, the answer is you just get the scientists in control. Keep it out of the politicians' hands. They'll be swayed by public opinion, and that's irrational. So get the scientists on top of it, and they can run the world. Okay? Now, Snow, who in many ways was sympathetic to some of these liberal leftist leanings that Bernal had, nevertheless thought this is a public relations disaster. And that was how it was received. Okay? And in fact, um, you know this book, 1984. Right? The spokesman for Big Brother is this guy, O'Brien. And O'Brien's the one who lays out for Winston Smith all of the precepts of Newspeak and what's going on, modeled on Burnell. Okay? Um, and because uh, Burnell was very much like O'Brien. Okay? Um, and he thought this was the most rational way to go. Now, the problem, as Snow saw it, was that somebody like Burnell had no respect for the the traditional values of the country. In a sense, he was so, his scientific training, even though he was a very learned man, there's no doubt about Bernal was a learned man, but he was culturally detached. Okay, and we go back to the Matthew Arnold point here, right? Where in a sense, what we're talking about when we talk about uh, the humanistic sensibility, it isn't just as it were learning certain facts about the past or, or memorizing Tacitus or something like that. That's not really the issue here. It's a certain kind of sensibility that comes from recognizing yourself, that part of your identity is formed by this kind of heritage, right? This sort of liberal democratic values. That in some sense, when you're participating in the public sphere in Britain, you are, uh, as it were, reenacting the, uh, the English Civil War and the cause of liberty and stuff like that. And you really feel that in your bones, OK? Uh, and that's not just hogwash. That should be something you feel. And what that will do is that will enable you to respect other people's opinions, even if they disagree, they disagree with yours. And you may be right in some technical sense, but you realize that you have to make an additional effort in order to get your point across, in order to persuade others. And this was a thing that C.P. Snow thought was very important for scientists to learn, and this is where the liberal arts would be of some use. It would humanize the science. Okay? It would humanize the science, reconnecting the scientists to the culture from which science has come. That was the idea. And, and, and this is an interesting point because the first science and technology studies program in the world was established on the back of this. Okay? And this is, I, I don't know how many of you, how familiar you people are with science studies, but uh, you know, we normally trace the beginning of this field that I'm in to the Edinburgh School. From, okay? The Edinburgh School, the science studies that came from there, is a direct result of all of this that I've been talking to you about, about C.P. Snow and his concerns. Uh, and in fact, the people who originated the Edinburgh School um, were themselves people who were scientifically trained. Uh, the guy who was the head of the school for, for many, many years died only a few years ago and founded the main journal in the field. David Edge was a, a, a radio astronomer who worked for the BBC at the time. So he was really in tune with the kind of thing that C.P. Snow was on about, right? And how people like Bernal were just failing, you know, not only failing the public, but were failing science as well. Because, see, the effect of somebody like Bernal was basically to turn the whole public against scientists and not to trust scientists because of this kind of full-on scientists need to take over the world thing. Okay. So the courses that were developed, and by the way, the person at Edinburgh who started all this, who, who was a kind of a, a, fr a friend of Bernal and a friend of Snow, uh, was um, Conrad Waddington, animal geneticist, professor of animal genetics, a man who himself wrote a lot of popular books on science, I mean, uh, have, has anyone heard of him? He was quite an important guy in his day. He was a major geneticist. Um, and he's the one who got the first proposals and then, hired the, and then hired the people who taught in the program. And the idea was this was going to be liberal arts training for science students. Um, and one of the consequences of this program, after it had been in existence for about five or six years, uh, one of the things that you found was that the kinds of fields that the scientists went into who actually had exposure to this liberal arts training um, were, you might say, more people-friendly fields. You had a smaller percentage who just went into pure basic research, and you had more people you know, going into sort of, you might say, interface applied fields of science where they were dealing with people. Okay? And, so, and, by, and from that standpoint, uh, the, the program was considered a success. Now, in the late 1960s, so now we move another 10 years, and 
Science studies becomes its own unit. It becomes its own field. It is no longer just doing service teaching for the natural scientists. And by this time, other such programs have been formed uh, not only in Britain, but also in the United States as well. And typically, all these programs were begun kind of the same way, right? Namely, from the science faculty side, concern about the way in which science is interfacing with the larger society, whether we're talking about the military-industrial complex or the environment, nuclear energy, right? All of these kinds of concerns, right? The way science is interfacing with them motivates the establishment of these science studies programs over the course of the 1960s. So the end of the 1960s, you start to see science studies arising as a field in its own right with its own journal finally in 1970. Um, and then people start to treat it as a discipline in its own right. Now, when that happens, okay, then you start, the seeds of the trouble begin that we find ourselves in now. Because science studies increasingly defines itself over the last, well now almost 40 years, um, inwardly, you might say, right? In terms of its own research trajectories, in terms of its own interests. Um, and it gradually moves away from this initial mission of reforming and rehumanizing science. So it becomes kind of a discipline in its own right to sit alongside all the other disciplines with its own journals, with its own peer review processes, etc. And it feels less and less accountable in any kind of way to the scientific community. And to a large extent, the science wars arise from that sort of development, combined with the fact that by the time we get to the late 1980s, with the end of the Cold War, there is a fundamental questioning happening in society at large about the nature of science funding, how should it proceed, who should do it, because the automatic state mandate that science should be funded because it's part of national security was no longer present. Okay? And so if you look at fields like physics, for example, they really take a big hit as a result of this. And not surprisingly, if you look at the profile of science funding, not only in this country but throughout the world, the areas that have really grown and are really flourishing um, in, in, the, in the wake of the, the post-Cold War period have been the ones where there are, clear, uh, there are clear market drivers going on. That is to say, in biomedical sciences in particular, and certain aspects of the biomedical sciences have really been flourishing, and other fields have just been declining. Okay? Um, and so you see this kind of uneven growth going on. And one of the things that that shows, in a way, is that there is no longer a taken-for-granted mandate that all of science needs to be equally funded. Rather, you fund science according to for whose good it does. And every, and every science has to find its market, you might say. And we live more in that kind of age. And it's been in this context that science studies then get seen as somehow anti-science. Because one of the things that science studies does when it humanizes science in the way that I was talking about before um, is it brings it down to earth. It makes science into a normal cultural social practice. And if you think about the ways in which we justify our normal cultural social practices, they do have a lot to do with things like for who's good, you know, the, you know what's, the, what's the social purpose, what's the function, right? the way we normally justify things. And that the traditional ways in which science gets justified, like the ultimate search for truth, objectivity, right, validity, all these kinds of big issue, big uh, conceptual issues, don't really play a very significant role. So in other words, science ends up having to justify itself very much the same way in which other things need to justify themselves. And so science becomes then in direct competition with non-scientific things for funding and attention and attraction. This doesn't mean that people are anti-science, but it does mean that science, as it were, cannot take for granted its own value. It has to actually make the case explicitly. And I think one way you can compare this I take it I'm about to, I'm about to finish here, okay? Um, is if you think about what happened uh, when you started to get the um, Protestant Reformation um, and you have the devolution of the Catholic Church, you might say, in terms of being the authority on Christianity. And you start to, as it were, see people splitting off, starting new churches, moving in different directions. One of the things that happens uh, to Christianity during this period is you start to get this enormous amount of evangelizing taking place. Why? Because there is no longer a state monopoly on a religion. You know, so if you, so in the old days, right, if the Catholic Church was the church of the country, in a sense, the church didn't have to really try very hard to get the followers, because the followers had to follow, like it or not. But once that disappears, once you get rid of the state monopoly on religion and it becomes a much more open market phenomena, then religious leaders have to actually actively compete 
to get the followers. And this is where evangelism comes in, because evangelism basically uses, you know, appeals to you personally to bring you into the church, right? It says basically, what is it, what's in it for you to be a member of my church? You see, and, and a lot of religious people, as you know, even today, object to this whole way of dealing with religion, where, we're, and, you know, where one is pitching religion all the time, okay? Well, it seems to me that we are now entering a period where science has to do stuff like that, where, in a sense, the state protection of science, whereby the scientists got money even if they didn't have to make an argument to the public just because it was presumed that science was a good thing and deserved to be funded, that's disappearing. And now you're getting this kind of more mo open market environment where scientists have to actually actively make their case to particular constituencies and, in a sense, make arguments as to what is it for them, in, in it for them to support science in particular ways. And that helps, in fact, to explain why the particular sciences that get funded today do get funded, because they actually do make those arguments effectively in the biomedical sciences, pharmaceutical industry, things of that kind. And, of course, some scientists don't play that game. But then it becomes an issue about how you justify the science. And the only point that I would make about this, I mean, I think, to a large extent, this is kind of an unfortunate situation. Um, but I do think that the way science studies ends up playing into this is, in a sense, this, in a sense, is part of what it means to humanize science. It is to bring science back into the mix of other social and cultural practices where the people who are making decisions about it aren't just making decisions about it in isolation for science for its own sake, but rather are making decisions about it in relation to other kinds of issues that concern them in their lives. Okay? Um, and I think this is kind of where we are at the moment. And it's not surprising that a lot of scientists find science studies very threatening and think and that, that we have the science wars going on, because that's basically where we are at the moment. We have a very demystified view of science on the table, which has involved lots of people get still remaining very interested in science, but not necessarily trusting any single authority in science, wanting to make the decision themselves, just as in the Protestant Reformation, right, people decide what church to go to. They don't feel like they're forced to be having to go to one church and not another. Okay, and I think that's kind of where we are now, where we're, we're entering into, a, play, into a, a time, a very strange time, where people actually are in a position to decide what science they want. It's a very strange idea, but I think this is kind of where we are at the moment. And I'll, I'll leave it there. Yes, sir. So, uh, Brunel, mm -hmm. um, saying that, um, uh, leave, like, uh, cultural affairs to, uh, the scientists, like, w what would he have proposed to do, like, differently from politicians? Well, I think the issue here was, uh, what he didn't like about democratic politics was basically it dithered too much, you might say, right? Because politicians are always kind of second guessing the public who's going to have to elect them for the next term. And so what happens as a result is that politicians tend to split too many differences. They tend to compromise too much. And they tend not to, uh, as it were, have any follow through, right? So even if a, if a politician says something very bold and dramatic, right, that could just disappear tomorrow in a puff of smoke if public opinion ratings drop, right? I mean, that's the kind of thing he's objecting to, is that kind of volatility. Uh, in, in, in that democracy breeds, which makes it very difficult to do anything very decisive, even if the evidence, right, points in a certain direction. You know, so you can imagine what Bernal would say about the climate change issue, right, where, where you know, okay, if there's a scientific consensus on the climate change thing, then, you know, you know we take over the G8, right? I mean, uh, that's pretty much what, you know, the way he would, uh, he would, he would operate with that. that. That democracy is dithering. It's inefficient. You see, I mean, that, that's because he's assessing, he's assessing <coughs> democracy and other forms of politics as basically um, engines for implementing results. He's not, he doesn't really see the intrinsic value of democracy. You know, the idea of people having, being able to speak their mind and disagreeing, he doesn't see the intrinsic value of that. He's looking at it from a purely outcomes orientation and he sees that it is inefficient. <laughs> 
Well, I mean, it depends what we're talking. I mean, I think one thing that scientists really need to uh, need to get a good market sense about is the market for research for its own sake, the market for blue sky stuff. Because I think at the moment, because I, I think actually the stuff that already has obvious practical consequences is already marketable, and the scientists have figured out how to do that already. I think that the tough thing, the thing that, that is hardest at the moment, is, is, is to maintain a market for stuff where the, where the practical consequences are not apparent in the short term. And so much important science has that characteristic. Right? This is one of the reasons why physics is starving. Okay? Um, and um, I think here, it's not going to be good enough for scientists um, to simply say, well, you know, um, you never know. Uh, what will be a spin-off or an unintended consequence of some sort of piece of research, even though that is true. The problem is that for most of the cases where that works, the amount of money that was spent on the science initially wasn't very high. So if you're talking about spin-offs from Faraday or Newton, you know, where some practical thing came about as a result of some very speculative thing they were doing, well, there wasn't a lot of money up front put for Newton and Faraday, right? So, so you're not really draining the resources by allowing those kinds of guys to survive. The problem now is that the startup cost for any kind of scientific research, even blue skies research, is very high. You need the right laboratories, right? In the case of physics, you'll need particle accelerators, right? I mean, the startup cost for blue sky research is so enormous that that's the real problem in a way, that speculative research is expensive to do. Um, and I think what, what scientists need to do is basically, um, well, a few things. I suppose uh, one of them would be to get a clearer sense of what, you know, how does one draw out the long-term consequences of this work? You know, in other words, work with some economists on this and try to figure out how do you actually come up with a coherent picture of Blue Sky's research having long-term benefit, even if it doesn't have short-term benefit. How do you actually measure that? How do you actually work, you know, make that concrete in some sort of way? Because I don't think at the moment we really have good economic models of that. And I think that's one of the things that makes it very difficult then to support the stuff. Okay, I mean, um, but I do think that's the, 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 the task. The task is to sell Blue Sky's research. Oh, sir? Yeah, and there was also this gentleman back here. Yeah, I just yeah, I was going to jump on that last question. We don't talk about it much. So where do you throw <coughs> technology in the mix there? Technology is both the stuff that scientists need and also is the public face of science. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, hmm, hmm. I, I guess I don't, um, I don't actually think technology has quite as much of a problem as science does in this matter. Because in a sense, I think si technology can kind of prove its worth more directly. Okay? I mean, I think the way in which, see, somebody like Bernal, if you ask Bernal, how do you justify pursuing science, he's going to give a kind of a, an intellectual answer in the sense that he's going to say the scientists are the smart guys. The scientists are the ones who have the comprehensive vision of reality, and that's why they should be running the world. That would be the argument, right? The argument is not in terms of scientists produce technological stuff. The argument is at the level of the mind of the scientist being especially rational. Right, you laugh, right, and everybody laughs these days, right? Science studies is victorious. Um, but uh, no, no, I mean, I, I think it's an, it's an indicator, right? Because I think that's the tough thing to sell, you might say, right? That, that there's a special mentality to science that, that, as it were, entitles it to be supported regardless of its technological consequences or whether it has any at all, but because there's something about the thinking, the reasoning of the science, you see? Um, and so in that respect, I think science is in bigger difficulty than technology is. That's, I, I don't think technology is in quite the sort of uh, trouble that, that, that I'm talking about. I don't know. I mean, th this gentleman over here, can I, can I take a, yeah. with regard to values. Uh, for example, the people who admire Norman Borlaug seem to be a set disjoint from those who admire Rachel Carson. Yeah. Uh, so the underlying difference in values seems to me to be yeah. very fundamental to the, what's going on. Yes, no, I agree. I, I do think that, that there is that. that uh, it is a bit of a mistake, I suppose, to think of the scientific community as being unified under a common set of values, that in fact they, 
do pull in many different ways. But I do think that the, the, the strong sense of public support for science and the kind of prestige that science has traditionally had in modern society does have a lot to do with there being a unified scientific mindset. Because if scientists were seen, as it were, as, as reproducing political distinctions that already exist in the public at large, I don't think they, they would have quite the same sort of prestige, right? That the value of, that the point about that Burnell, right, is that the scientist rises above the value differences that already exist in society through other means. Now, if you don't believe that, then there is an issue about what's so special about science. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you were talking about gentlemen about Bernal, but I mean, while you seem to be kind of down on Bernal and about, am I? Hmm. It's. <laughs> I, I realize it's not a particularly like romantic view of science as being in charge and all because of like this rationalism and stuff being mm -hmm. the highest end. At the same time, I think what he feared was we look at people like Richard Dawkins, Stephen Hawking, who are, you know, Carl Sagan, who are accomplished scientists in, in their own right, but then what happened to them is they s sold out. They needed something to fund, and, you know, these kind of people, I think, turned more to a private sector of having their own money to fund whatever projects they want. But they're kind of evangelic, you know, like... Uh, <coughs> Evangelist for their yeah. own purposes, anyway. So I think that's what you know he was so opposed to. Whereas if you have the scientists in like in power, they don't have to like kiss ass. Yeah. The people hunt. No, that's know. right. That's that is the point. Yeah, yeah. Though I think uh, I don't see Richard Dawkins kissing much ass, frankly. But uh, <laughs> now in a way, Richard Dawkins is a bit Bernalish, uh, especially his atheism crusade, right? Because yeah. the atheism crusade is built on the back of scientific viewpoint, right? If you have a scientific worldview, you'll see the plausibility of atheism, right? Um, but, but no, I, I think your, your, your general point about Bernal is absolutely right, right? The whole point is scientists should not, you know, scientists can rule because they don't have to kiss ass. It's very much like Plato's philosophers, philosopher kings, right? Who are training in, in, in sort of isolation for many years, that they're, but by, by the time they're set loose on the polis, uh, they, they are above it all. Nothing can influence them. And that's kind of what Bernal was going after, actually. That kind of above it all sort of thing, which he thought the Politburo would have. <laughs> yeah. To what degree, uh, when you talk about funding and so on, I assume you mean uh, public sector funding largely. Uh, to what degree do you think um, the problem there is the result of the fact that the, the panacea that science is once seen as being to solve the world's problems may not, at least in the public eye, have worked out in public eye? Yeah. No, that's absolutely right. And I think this was one of the things that Snow picked up on, okay? Um, and not just Snow, I mean, you know, this was not just happening in isolation in Britain, I should point out. In the United States, James Bryan Conant, the president of Harvard at the, that time, in the 50s, um, making very similar points for justifying general education and science. But that's another story for another day. But the thing that, that both of these guys were very concerned about was this kind of, you might say, uh, hyperbolic views about science, which people like Bernal were actually promoting, right? Because, I mean, you know, if you're Bernal, you do believe scientists can run the world, which is really setting you up for a fall if you screw up, okay? Um, and, and so that, Snow realized that was, that could well happen, and so he didn't want that kind of talk to be part of the scientist's public vocabulary, right? He thought that the scientists should be quite modest and humble and, and, and should try to, you know, kind of lessen the expectations not, dim not diminish them entirely, of course, because science can do a lot of good things, but to raise the kinds of issues that, in fact, do now get raised a lot, you know, the degree of uncertainty in the various things that we are, you know, talking about, you know, so yes, this is what we seem to think it will happen, but, you know, it's only within, we got all these margins of error that you got to keep in mind, and it's not dogmatic, and that's the kind of thing that Snow wanted scientists to be more self-consciously, you know, more self-conscious about, is that kind of stuff, which Burnell lacked completely, okay? But no, that's right. And, and, and science studies, you see, actually has been very good in promoting that point. You know, that science is uncertain and it's contested and it's never the final word and that there's always ways of, you know, rethinking the issue and that you shouldn't raise your expectations too much. But you see, the problem is if you take that argument too far, then it completely demystifies science and people wonder why they're supporting science at all. Right? So this is, the, this is kind of the problem. This is why we have the science wars, is that, that, that slide that can very easily take place from admitting uncertainty to then saying anything goes. <laughs>
what Bernal was reacting to in the 1950s, um, why he's making this statement. Um, and my understanding of, of the politics of the time is that you have different ministries and the leadership of the ministry, they, they aren't specialists in the area That's that right. they might be having to deal with. Yeah, and he thought that was and, a problem. And that, that, that is what his... Yeah, he wanted to rule by experts, right? I mean, he's one of the... That, that, you know, that's kind of how we would put it today, rule by experts. And, 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 and I think there was a certain kind of romanticized vision of the Soviet Union that was operating here, okay, that, that, that he participated in. He spent a lot of time in the Soviet Union. He was kind of a promoter of the Soviet Union as a kind of model for a post-war world, okay? Um, and this is one of the things that, in fact, made him really fall out of political favor because he was... I'm not even sure whether he ever denounced Stalin in the end. You see what I mean? He was really there for a long time with, back in the Soviets, even after stuff started getting very nasty. Um, but that's the issue, yeah. Rule by experts. That's kind of what he wanted. And the, and the, the, the amateurism. I mean, in British politics, it's, I mean, it's very noticeable even today. Um, we have a lot of cabinet reshuffles in Britain, where everybody kind of gets, gets a chance to sort of play every kind of role if they hang around long enough in politics. And you wonder, wow. That's pretty interesting in a way. These people must be kind of jack of all trades. And of course, they're Oxbridge trained, they're very fluent and clever and all the rest of it. And so they do move between these jobs with amazing ease. But if you're Bernal, you're saying, this, this is ridiculous. There's got to be a better way than this. Because these people are just, you know, faking it. Right? They're faking it to the next general election. Yeah, I'm, I'm a political scientist. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess I'm not a scientist. I'm not sure. Hey. You can be one for sake of argument. <laughs> you, you made a representation earlier about um, how um, some people in this debate view the social sciences yeah. uh, and their relation to the black slave, for example. Yeah. And in particular, how that led to some sort of perverse outcomes politically. Yeah. Um, I'd like you to clarify that because having been a political scientist for a long time, that, that didn't ring true to my understanding of my own discipline. Yeah, yeah. No, no. I, I No, I said it's a good question. Um, no, 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 no. It's a fair question. Um, there's a term that gets used in this uh, in this literature of Pinker and the evolutionary psychologists when they're bashing social scientists, and it's the triple SM, the standard social science model. And what that basically is is the idea that anything about human beings can be explained by looking at their differences, right? That there's nothing to be, that the human nature doesn't play any kind of explanatory role in any kind of human activity, but it's just understanding particular cultures, particular environments, and the differences between them explain people's behavior, okay? That's what they're, be, that's, that's the thing under direct attack, okay? Um, I think if you're a certain kind of uh, historicist, relativist, sociologist, I think you feel the sting of this, because I do think that is the target. But not only that, uh, within psychology, I would also say behaviorists. I mean, if you think about it, the, the B.F. Skinner variety, where you can condition people to do anything if you give them the right reinforcement schedules, right? That's also a target, right? So you've got, you know, you, you know all the people who, who, in a sense, black boxed the brain and genes and all of that. Those people are the target, okay? Um, now, of course, that doesn't cover all the social scientists, um, but I do think if you want to talk about as it were, what makes the social sciences look different from the other disciplines, as opposed to similar, right? Uh, that that is, you know, what's being described there does kind of capture quite a lot of what's distinctive about the social sciences and the way, and especially the kind of mentality it breeds. Because if you believe that you know you change the environment, you can change the world, right? Then then the, that in, in, you know informs your political sensibility. So they're obviously taking an, you know, making an attack at people who have very grandiose, utopian kind of political schemes on the back of what they regard as you know, scientific knowledge. So that's kind of the, the, the attack. I, I admit, not everybody holds this view in social science. Of course not. But I think it's quite a recognizable view, right? And characteristic of a certain kind of, you know, orthodox left in the 60s and 70s would be the heyday for this, I think. I mean, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't see it. Let's put it this way. It's sufficiently recognizable that people get upset by it. Yeah. Hi. 
Um, you have to forgive me. I come straight out of a scientific background, and actually, with the direction I work swimming in, I'll probably always find NSF funding because we are kind of a blue sky research. I'm sorry. That we are, are the lab that I work in, and the direction I'm going in, we are kind of a blue sky research lab. Oh, good. So the NSF funding is specifically for uh, research that has no obvious purpose. Well, that's good. Okay. Yeah. So far, so good. Yeah. So you, know, you go out with a Velcro and whatnot out of this, um, you know, studying plant thistles. So there is funding for this. And you had mentioned earlier that science needs to better, for this sort of research, uh, display to the public why it might be useful. Perhaps work with economists and whatnot to build models of how it might be useful in the long term. In the long term, yeah. And not the short term. Mm -hmm. um, it's very difficult to do because it's probabilistic if you can figure sure. it all. Sure, um, sure. And I was wondering, assuming that we would need to make that case to continue getting the sort of funding that I get now, what kind of a case would you make as a sociologist for what sociology provides to the public? Well, a lot cheaper, first of all. I think that helps. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, that's, a, that's an important point. I mean, because, because these issues matter depending on what the, how much funding we're talking about, right? I mean, I think that's the first point. Um, I don't think this issue would be such a big issue if, if scientific research was cheaper. Okay, um, I think that's the, that's the, the point. Um, I thought you were going to ask a somewhat different question, uh, because I do think the strategy one would use to show these long-term impacts probabilistically, as you were rightly say, would be doing history of science. I mean, a certain, kind of a certain kind of history of science, I think, could show this, but it would have to be a little bit different from the kind of garden variety history of science that's done these days, which, which in a way tends to be very humanistic but if you actually had some economists working with some historians of science and tracing out the effects of various kinds of things over the long term and what difference they made, for example, you know, that were it not for this kind of discovery, it's highly unlikely down the road that this sort of thing would happen, using sort of counterfactual <laughs> analysis that economic historians often use, I think you can make the arguments. Okay? Uh, that's how I would kind of go for that and have those kinds of models on the table drawn from historical examples. That's what I would do. Damn right. That's why I put these names up there. Yeah, a lot of branding of disciplines, mm -hmm. and also of disciplines almost either drinking the Kool-Aid or idealizing the other. <laughs> and then the talk of it's like, well, we need scientists to be more human. Oh, we'll go to the humanists. Yeah, I know. Like, what an idea. Like, like they know how to make people human. Yeah, yeah. Or it's like, oh, we need to know how to do this. We'll go to the biologists, right? And there's this sense, I was wondering if you could comment on if this is a kind of a continual trend, a recent trend of looking at science as almost really having the answers and really branding is like, yes, we really know this discipline and we're not just as confused, in many ways, more confused than other people. Well, you see, the, 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 the thing is that the branding is already there, right? That, that, that um, you know, so for example, one reason why in this country, for example, there's such heated controversies over what gets included in science, high school science textbooks, you know, will creationism be taught, right, sort of thing, right, is because science <laughs> is considered to be the premier form of knowledge, right? And so if something gets in a science textbook, it's very serious knowledge in a way it might not be if it were in a history book or, a, or an English book or, or something like that. So now that's, that's something, of course, scientists have lobbied for, and somebody like Brunel would be very happy with that kind of view. Um, but it, it seems to me that that is, as it were, the, the social facts of the situation, that, that in a way, when you, when you take away science's superiority as a form of knowledge, where it's sort of the gold standard of all knowledge. If you get rid of that, then I think you really, um, scientists are going to have to struggle very hard with all these other fields to continue getting funding and support. Okay? Um, and, and I have very mixed feelings about that. Okay? Um, I mean, because um, I do think it is useful that scientists have been demystified to a certain extent, but I don't want to see a kind of intellectual free-for-all. But we could be easily moving in that direction, it seems to me. Um, and, and, and the big problem, I think, at the end of the day, is that science is expensive to do. And because of the costs, you know, the burden of proof gets heavier, right? And the scientists really have to show, because they're asking for so much money, they really have to show what the point is, you know? Um, and, uh, I mean, I'll give you an example. In Britain, um, there is a lot of, uh, you know, the, 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 the homeopathic uh, complementary medicine people are, are, are gaining increasing kind of foothold in, in the country, and, and uh, 
It isn't just because uh, people like it, but it's cheap. They're virtually doing nothing, right? I mean, uh, the <laughs> no offense. Uh, <laughs> um, but, but the point is, that's an important issue, right? And, and when people start thinking in terms of cost benefit, and then they think placebo effect, it's real. And they say, well, why are we then spending all this money in biomedical research? We could just hire a couple of homeopaths and boom, we could go on vacation. You know, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, th 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 there is that kind of issue, right? They're right, because science is very, it's very expensive, increasingly expensive to do. And if the competitors are cheaper and have a more natural appeal to the public, which homeopathy and complementary medicine actually do, right? They, they're very user friendly. Um, you know, then there's a real issue here. There gets to be a real issue. And, and they've made headway just on that alone. You see, and, and for scientists to trash these people doesn't help. It doesn't help. It really, it just raises sympathy for them. So it's a tricky issue, I think, from a public relations standpoint, what scientists should do about this. Sure, but I mean, do you see this as an issue of branding or not? Well, what do you mean? Branding in terms of what so is... So like right now, it's like if you go to buy a car, right? Yeah. There's the Lexus and the Mercedes. I say, right? I want the people, science car. People like just think, oh, it's a Mercedes. Oh wow, it must be. The engineering is so much better, and I'm willing to spend so much more money on it. Yeah. And I just trust that oh, these people really know what they're doing. Yeah, that's declining with regard to science. All those right. attitudes. And I guess I'm, what I'm curious is, is this an intentional purpose of these scientific disciplines to try and brand themselves as, you know, don't really look behind in the details of, just trust us. Like, we really know what we're doing. Okay, I'm not so cynical about this. You're a very cynical man. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, look, there are two issues here. I actually think that the scientists who do promote this kind of view that, you know, science is the best form of knowledge and, you know, you know why, why, why settle for second best, right? Um, I, I think those people really believe it, right? And in a sense, they can give the arguments for it formally with regard to methodology and stuff of that kind. The problem is that Science studies actually looks at the practice that tracks this language, right? And when you look at the actual practice of science and how it works on a day-to-day -day basis, there's a lot more slop, a lot more messiness, a lot more opportunities for, you know, malfeasances to occur, right? Sometimes the scientists themselves don't even notice, right? So that once that is revealed to the public, right, then you start to get the skepticism, right? But it's not necessarily because the scientists are trying to cover up something, right, right, but, but you're right. And, and, and this is one of the things that I think makes science studies in this regard, a, 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 bit, a, a sort of a political football, right? Because in a sense, here we are doing all these studies, going into these labs, showing what scientists really do, showing it's very messy and just like everything else. And then it gets into the public domain, right? And then, you know, the scales fall from the public's eye and they're no longer so enchanted by science and then they cut the science funding. That's kind of what kind of the science wars works. Right now the problem is, is has that all been a mistake? Was it a mistake for science studies people to do this in the first place? I don't think it has been. But I think the scientists now have to kind of rethink what they're about in light of it. And I think that's the, that's the hard part. That's very hard. And I actually think people in my field ought to be a little more helpful to them. I, I see two more questions. Two more is uh, my, my question is just a bit of a follow-up to what you're saying just now, which is if the science studies mission was to humanize scientists, which then led the need to sell science to the public. Does that then arrive at a point where the implication is that all things should be understandable by all people, and if they're not, um, you know, we sort of dismiss the notion of expertise at all. Like, I get to have an opinion as to whether vaccinations cause autism or not, yeah. equal to yours, yeah. unless you can explain it to me over a beer in a way that I can understand it. That's a good standard. Um, is that a good standard? I mean, well, we, like, I, we like the presidents on that standard, but are we going to really... Well, well, okay, well, this is where, I mean, this is where the, the, the ghost of Burnell comes back in, right? I mean, you know, um, it seems to me that uh, if we do value our democracy and we, and we want to subject all forms of authority, you know, as we do our elected officials, to democratic accountability, then it should be possible for scientists to explain what they're doing to us over a beer. This doesn't mean we shouldn't be learning more. Okay, so there's two points here, right? There's two points here. I, I know what you're going after here. Um, right, that, that, that the public needs to engage with science more, to learn more about it, to be more interested in it. But you see, I think that's already happening to a large extent, largely through the internet and the, and the possibility of getting alternative sources to things. 
Now, I'm not saying necessarily that this stuff is reliable that they're getting on the internet, uh, but they are getting lots of different sources of information, and it forces them to, I think, to smarten up because with all the conflicting information they get, some of them from the, from the, the, the regular experts and some from other people, they have to make decisions for themselves about what to believe. And I don't think that's such a bad thing, okay? Um, I mean, obviously, there are going to be certain kinds of decisions that we would want to take collectively and centrally, but there'll be certain kinds of issues where I think people will end up experimenting with their lives, you know, as to whether to have a particular vaccine or not. And, 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 he, and you know, people will choose to go against what the scientific experts say. You know, I mean, already certain religions do this, right? Christian science and things of that kind. Well, I think you're going to see more of that in the future, actually. And I think it's, it's the issue of whether we can live in, you know, whether we can tolerate that, right? That people can look at all the different opinions and they see the scientific experts, but they don't believe them. I think, in a sense, we have to learn to tolerate that. I mean, they just threw someone in jail for not treating their children medically. Exactly. Yeah, I know. So is that part of the democratization of science and a, a, a virtue of value? You know, this is what we've achieved, that science studies, is, you know, anybody's opinion is valid? It's not that anyone's opinion is valid, but there is something to be said for the idea that you live with the consequence, you know, that when it comes to issues of knowledge, you know, you choose the things that you want to live with. Okay? Um, and, and uh, you know, in this respect, I'm kind of a Protestant with regard to science, you know, in the sense that there is a decision to take, whether to believe what the authority says or not. It's not a taken for granted idea what the answer to that question is. Okay? And I, and I think, look, whether you like my opinion or not, the internet and the multiple sources of information at people's disposal is creating alternative sources of expertise and authority, counter expertises and everything. And science studies actually studies this stuff too. Um, and it's really striking how there are all these different sorts of multiple expertises and things that are developing all over the place. Um, and the thing that's interesting about it is it is evidence of public's engagement with science. This is not anti-science, right? These are people who are really getting into the science and they're getting so into it they're disagreeing with the authorities because they're really trying to come to terms with what's being said and then they're making a decision about whether they think it's right or wrong. They're not just sort of passively rolling over the way they might have done in the past. And so from that standpoint, I'm sort of hopeful. But it'll be very volatile, no doubt about it. It'll be a very volatile situation. I think we have time for one more question, Philip Brown. Let us scientists go last. Just then, you talked a little bit about funding of uh, blue skies. Yeah. It strikes me that, uh, that that argument really comes back to something you talked about earlier, which is the question of values. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, what's the value of understanding the yeah. origins of the universe versus having a Teflon frying pan? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I, I sort of wonder, you know, I'll just throw this out to you, when we talk about um, funding of, of Blue Skies research, is there any sort of parallel or analogy to be made between the funding of that and the support of that type of activity and, for example, funding of the arts? I was thinking about that as you were asking the question. I thought you would be going there. I think that that's a good analogy to pursue, actually. And to be honest with you, uh, economists have actually done more work in that area about the justification of arts funding, and I think that that would be a way to go, to look at some of that research to figure out economic justifications for blue sky science funding. I think that's, that's a very good way to go, actually. James Tobin has been one of the people involved in that. There, there are lots of people who've been looking at that. I, I agree. I invite you to continue this discussion over food in the back, and to thank Thank you.